Hey everybody, welcome to the next installment of Statistics in Pajamas. This time we're moving in a slightly different direction. Instead of having uh, variables that are measured on different observations, we're just going to count the number of observations that we have. And that brings us to the chi-square analysis. If we go into our now very full flowchart of when to run what analysis, we're really going to start right off at the very top. What is the type of response data that we have? We've been pretty solidly in having a continuous variable that's been measured on each of our observations, but now we're moving into just counting how many observations we have that fall into different classes. And if we have only one variable with however many classes are within that variable, we're talking about the chi-square goodness of fit test, and we'll start off with that one. It's pretty straightforward. If we have more than one variable and we want to see how these frequencies or counts of observations fall into multiple po possible combinations of categories across more than one variable, then we're in the chi-square test for independence. And we'll look at that too. So when we're talking about frequency data, we literally are just saying, imagine that we have one variable. It's the number of cups of coffee that you would drink in a day. And you're grouping these into different categories. You have 0 to 3 cups of coffee, 4 to 7, 8 to 11, so on and so forth. And we just go out there and we see how many observations. In this case, I imagine we're talking about people. And we would just find out whether they fall into this category, this one, this one, or this one. And we just tally it up and we end up with a frequency or a number of our observations that fall into each of these different classes. So this is an example of a goodness fit test where we only have one variable. And just like our other inferential tests, we need a formula called the chi-squared that we can use to quantify how the distribution of this frequency where these counts fall across these classes, how that matches what we would expect if there were no differences or no relationships among these different classes. And that is our chi-squared test statistic. But what it implies is that not only do we have to know what we actually observed, right? So we observed that there were two people who drank zero to three cups of coffee a day. But we also have to know what we expect, right? So this is what's really unique about the chi-squared. It doesn't have to have a null hypothesis of nothing or that they're all the same, in which case you would just divide the number of total observations you have so that they're equal in each of these categories. That would be the no difference hypothesis, null hypothesis. But you could actually specify what you hypothesize that sort of distribution should be across those different classes. And that would be our expected. So all that the chi-square test statistic is doing is it's looking to quantify the difference between how many observations we actually observed, that's the O, and how different that is from how many observations we expected. And just like in our other tests, because we're not necessarily interested in quantifying whether the observed is higher or lower, just to get at the whether or not there's a significant difference, we square it, right? That just gets rid of that uh, the sign of the difference and just gives us a magnitude of the difference. And we divide it by the expected, so it ends up being a proportion, right? So how far off are we from what's expected proportionate to how much was expected? So we're going to do this for every single one of our cells. So we would do that for the 0 to 3 cups of coffee class and the 4 to 7 cups of coffee class and so on and so forth. And then sum them all up over all of the classes. And that gives us our chi-square test statistic. Essentially what this test statistic is telling us is how far off our counts are from what we would have expected. Well, this is called a one sample chi-square goodness of fit test. So you're basically trying to say how well do our observed counts fit the expected counts? What is the goodness of fit for that? If you expected that uh, your observations fall into different categories randomly, then you would expect that there would be an equal number in each of those different categories. So as an example, if you're an environmental studies student, you have three different options for a capstone experience. You can either do a thesis, you can do an internship, or you can select an external minor. And so what we have here are the counts of the number of students who selected each of those. 
and we could just do a simple test to see if there's just an even number of students in each of these different options. So in other words, does the frequency for each of these different categories, is it approximately equal? I mean, we can see that they're not exactly equal, but we're talking about statistically speaking, if we were to expand this analysis to the larger population of all environmental study students, would we see a relatively equal proportion um, broken down into each of these categories? Well, we can just add these up and we can see that really we had 60 students students in this pool total and if I were just testing a null hypothesis that there's no difference or no preference um, between these three options I would assume that there'd be an equal number of students choosing each so my expected would be 20, 20, and 20 and then use the difference between the expected 20 and what I observed 18 square that divided by my expected and come up with a chi-square value for this cell then do the same thing for the next cell and the same thing for the last cell. Sum them all up and that's giving me my test statistic that's going to help me determine whether or not I have a significant deviation from that frequency of 20, 20, and 20 that I expected. But what's really neat about the chi-square goodness of fit is I could specify whatever proportions I truly think are going to happen. I can make a hypothesis. So for example, Perhaps I hypothesize that most students are going to do a minor because, well, a thesis is really hard and you have to do a lot of research and it takes a lot of work. Internships are great, but they're hard to come by. Anybody can do a minor. Now, maybe I think that, I don't know, 40% of these students are taking the minor option and that would leave only 30 and 30% for the other two. So I can actually figure out what the expected values would be just by following this simple formula. To figure out my expected frequency, I take the total number of observations that I have and I just multiply it by the expected proportion. Right? So in this example, if I had three categories and I expected equal distribution, then that's a third or 33%. Right? If, on the other hand, as we just mentioned, if I were hypothesizing that this minor were actually 40%, I could just take my total number of observations, 60, and multiply it by 0.4. I know that I would expect to see 24 observations or counts in this minor category. And then I could do the same and figure out what would be the expected for the 30% for this category and this category. And then I could do the same exact thing and calculate that chi-square test statistic to see if what I observe deviates significantly from that new expected distribution. So it's really quite versatile. And again, remember, this is meant to be an inferential test. So it's not just about describing how students pick their different capstone choices for the data set you collected. It's trying to make an inference about how the larger population of all environmental study students would select their options. So let's look at this with some real data to, just to clarify. So imagine you are studying these field nesting bird species and you're trying to understand um, the competitive advantage among them. And so you want to see if a certain species is more or less successful nesting in these small fields that are found around Vermont. So your null hypothesis is that if this nesting success is just random and all of these different species are equally competing for nesting sites, then you would expect there to be an equal number of nests of each of these three different species. My alternative hypothesis is just that, well, the numbers that I expect to see are not going to be equal among those three different species. Okay, so this is what my chi-square test statistic is calculating, is how far off I am from this expected random or equal distribution across those three categories. Okay, so imagine the fun part's over. You've been out in the field and you've looked at all the cute little nests and all the little chickies, and you've found 90 total nests. And just to avoid any bias here, because I know everybody has their favorite bird, we're just going to call them species A, B, and C. And we can see how many nests we counted for each of these different species and then the total number of nests that we have. So from the field data, we had our observed counts. We need to now figure out the expected counts. And since we're assuming there'd be an equal distribution and we have only three categories, it means there'd have to be a third of all observations in each of these different species categories. I should expect to have 30 nests for each of these different species. 
So remember, this formula is pretty straightforward. I just take my observed count minus my expected count. I square it for each cell, then I divide that by the expected to sort of get an expected deviation. I like to set this up in a table just to keep things straight. So here I have each of my observed counts for each of my species, the expected counts. I do the first step, which is just calculating the difference. So that gives me a new column for each of my different categories. And then I just take that number and square it, right? That's giving me the numerator here. So that's what this next column is. And then I divide that by the expected value again. And so this is my chi-square test statistic value for each individual category. So it's a 1.63 for species A, a 5.63 for species B, and a 13.33 for species C. But for this overall goodness of fit test, I need to sum all of these up to come up with one overall chi-square test statistic. And this is what I'm going to use to determine whether or not there's a significant deviation from my expected distribution of 30, 30, and 30 for this test. We need something to compare this calculated test statistic to to know whether or not we deviate significantly from what would be expected. And to figure that out, we have to use a table, and to use a table, we have to know how many degrees of freedom that we have. So the way degrees of freedom are calculated for a chi-square test is that it's really just looking at the number of different categories that you have minus one. So for the goodness of fit test, that's only one variable. So it's literally just that, how many different rows, right? This is a row for one category, another row for another category, and so on and so forth. How many different rows or total categories do you have? Minus one. But when we get into the test for independence, we're also going to have multiple columns because we're looking at two variables. So just keep in mind that this does get a little bit more co complicated with that chi-square table and that we're going to have to calculate our degrees of freedom a little bit differently when we get into the chi-square test for independence. And if what we've calculated is more extreme than what's in the table, then we know we deviate significantly from what was hypothesized or how those frequencies were expected to break down across the categories. For our bird example, we had three different species, three different categories. I subtract one. That means I have two degrees of freedom for this test. And I'm going to use that simple 0.05 alpha threshold. So that tells me I'm in this column. There are my two degrees of freedom. So my critical value is 5.99. So if my calculated test statistic exceeds 5.99, then I know that my frequencies deviate significantly from what was expected. And we probably could have looked at this and saw that, wow, species C is at 50 and species B is only at 17. There's probably a significant difference from just random distribution across those three categories. But this table is what's going to help us really solidify the statistical evidence for that. And just like all of our other tests, we have some shorthand to spit all of that out so we don't have to write it out in these paragraph summaries. We're specifying that we're using the chi-square test statistic. We specify how many degrees of freedom were associated with that test. We write down the exact chi-square test statistic we calculated. And then we can say whether or not this exceeded or did not exceed our critical value. Now when you write this up, it's very similar to our other tests, right? You start off with a statement of what you were hypothesizing. This is especially important for the chi-square goodness of fit test because we have to know if you were hypothesizing a frequency of just random distribution or if you were hypothesizing very specific proportions across your categories. Tell me what kind of test you were running give me the shorthand, and then you have to interpret these results. And just like with our ANOVAs, you can't just stop with a, yes, this is significantly different than what I expected or not. You have to describe how that was different. And so the way that you can go back in and interpret these is go back and look to see which of your different categories had the highest individual chi-square test statistic. And that's telling you where the biggest difference lies. So if we can see that species C has an individual chi-square test statistic, which I report here, of 13.33. That all by itself is significant based on that 5.99 critical value. So what that's telling us is that really 
most of this difference is coming from the, the fact that species C is way different from what we expected, right? And so that's just the first part is identifying which of your categories are really contributing to that difference the most. But then the second step is to describe how. So I can see that based on my observed and my expected that I'm actually getting a lot more, significantly more nesting than I expected for species C, right? So I should state that in here, right? Species C was significantly higher than expected, right? And then I can look at the next one. What's my next highest chi-square? 5.63, that's still pretty high. That was the next most uh, significant category that deviated from what was expected, but this one at 17 was lower than what I expected, right? So species B is significantly lower than what was expected. These really low chi-square values, don't worry about reporting them. You're really trying to just focus on where the largest difference lie, right? And so then you can interpret this. And what I'm saying is clearly the distribution is not random, but maybe I could test a different distribution and see if that fits. Right? So I could go back in and I could hypothesize, well, maybe species C is three times as successful as A or B. I could actually test that to see if that is the true pattern that we're witnessing. Right? So if I want to figure out what that expected frequency would be, that's all I'm doing is going back and repeating the exact same set of calculations here, right? But I'm just changing my expected proportions. Well, if I said that species C was three times the other, I can just plug this in and I can figure out that really what that means is that species A should be 0.2, species B should be 0.2, and species C should be 0.6. Right? And then I can multiply that by my total number of nests and figure out whether or not or what the, what the actual expected values would be. So now when I sum all of these up, I have a chi-square test statistic of 1.74, which when I go back in and compare that again to my critical value table, does not exceed that critical value, which means that I've hit it. I've hit the nail on the head. It really is that species C is three times as successful as either species A or species B. And so then I could summarize that. Same thing, state exactly what my hypothesis is, state the test, give me the shorthand, interpret that, and this is what it's telling me. I found the pattern for this distribution. Obviously we can do this in jump as well, although I have to say it's not as intuitive as some of our other analyses have been. And I think a part of that is just because of the way the data table is set up. So now you're not going to have each row being an individual observation. When you're running a chi-square analysis, each row is just one of your classes of your variable. So we had species A, B, and C, and then its actual frequency, the observed frequencies uh, listed in there. And so so if we come into the main toolbar, right, the analyze toolbar, we actually want to go into distribution. We're not in the fit model or fit y by x. We're back in the distribution because really we're just trying to see how these counts are distributed across the different classes. So I'm going to enter whatever my variable is, in this case it's species, as my y column, and then Jump is going to know to do a chi-square analysis because you're going to enter this count or this frequency data in the frequency box. Right? It does not go up here with the Y and there's no X. It's just, it's the frequency. You're telling it this is a frequency. So let's actually go into Jump to show you how to do this. So again, I have my species, each of my different categories, my counts. If I come up here into Analyze and I ask to analyze the distribution, here is my species, that's the variable of interest. My count is a frequency. When I click OK, Jump is going to give me, sorry, hang on, this default output here, where it's just again summarizing what each of my counts are. And then it actually breaks down the probability for me. So this is the actual probability for the observed data. So to do our chi-square test, guess where we go? The magic red triangle. And we come right down here into test probabilities. And notice if you hover over this, it tells you that it's computing a chi-square test, right? And it'll allow us to specify the probabilities. So when we click on this, it says, okay, well, what is your hypothesized probability for each of these? In our first example, when we were just testing to see if each of the species was equally successful or were expecting a third of all observations in each of these. All right, and so when I enter that and then I can just say 
done, they will actually spit out the probability test statistics. So we have been doing by hand the Pearson's, either the likelihood ratio or Pearson's are both equally accepted. Pearson's is just mathematically easier to do by hand. So there's our calculated test statistic right there, 20.6, the degrees of freedom associated with that, and then here is the actual p-value. So if you're doing this in jump, you don't have to say p less than 0.05, tell me exactly was the probability. If I wanted to test a different, different probability, I can just come back in, and I think we said that we expected um, species C to be three times higher, so I could enter that in. Right, let me pull this up so that you can see. Click Done. And so now here is the probability associated with that set of expected distributions, and we can see it's not significant. So this actually is a pretty good approximation for the entire populations of birds if we had gone into every single field across all of Vermont. Okay, so that summarizes your chi-square goodness of fit test. You just have one variable, and you want to see how the counts of different observations are distributed across those different categories for that one variable. But as I mentioned, we can expand that to include additional variables. Right? So now we want to see if our expected distribution of observation fits not just one variable here, for example, this is a species of tree, an eastern hemlock versus, versus a western hemlock. So species would be one variable with two different categories. And we want to also see whether or not these are infested or uninfested. So there's another variable, infestation, with two categories. Right. So this is essentially a two by two chi-square test for independence. And we can expand upon that even more, but let's just uh, keep it simple here. What's really interesting about this test for independence is that it's almost like an interaction test in uh, factorial ANOVA. Essentially what you're trying to say is if the category of one of those variables that an observation falls into is either dependent on or independent of the category it's in in the other variable. In other words, if you know being in one category sort of implies that you're likely to fall into a different category of the other variable, or if they're just independent. So that's why we call it a test for independence. So I'm going to go to another example. Um, this time we're going to get political, since you know political seasons are always interesting. So imagine that you are looking at um, voters' preferences on gun control, right? Are you either pro-gun control, against gun control, or neutral on gun control? You could just care less, right? And so they developed a questionnaire and they're not just interested to see if more or less people are in favor of or against gun control. They want to know how your opinion on gun control differs based on your political affiliation. Right? Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Um, and so we want to see whether or not your political affiliation right, is in some way associated with your views on gun control issues. Or you can think of it the other way around. We're not talking about cause and effect. We're just talking about associations or independence. So it could just as well be that your opinion on gun control issues really does uh, play a part in which political party you are affiliated with. Now if you're doing this by hand it gets a little more complicated because you have additional variables but the setup is still similar. Here we have our political party. This is one variable with two different levels. They are either Democrat or Republican. And then we have our other variable which is gun control. Whether you oppose it, you're neutral on it, or you favor gun control. And then inside the meat of this table are the actual or observed frequencies. How many people were Democrats and opposed? How many were Republicans and opposed? And so on and so forth. Now notice to make this easier to figure out the expected values, right, we have these additional uh, rows and columns where we just sum it up. What was the total number of people who opposed? The total who were neutral? The total who were in favor? How many total Democrats do we have? How many total Republicans do we have? So these new columns are here to help us figure out how to calculate the expected frequency. Right? The observed is easy. It's just how many people fell into each of these possible categories. The expected is a little bit more complicated. So when we're doing a test for independence, we're no longer um, hypothesizing a specific proportion. We really are just testing to see whether or not these two variables are associated or independence or independent. So what that means is that I want to take to figure out the expected for each cell. What was the total 
number of observations or the frequency for each row, multiply it by the total number of observations for its own column, and then divide it by the overall frequency. And what that's doing is it's giving me a proportion of all the observations that should fall in any specific cell. So if I were trying to figure out my expected frequency, I know that I had 25 total people who opposed gun control. So I'm putting the 25 up there. I know I had 50 total Democrats. I put the 50 there. I just multiply those together and then divide it by the total number of observations. That gives me 13.89. That means that if these are independent variables and not associated with each other, I should expect to see 13.89 observations falling within this Democrats who oppose category. And we just do that for each of our individual cells. So we had our observed, and we have now our expected frequencies. So now we calculate the test statistic in the exact same way. So we're literally going to do that. Observed minus expected squared divided by the expected. So that's going to give us the chi-square for this specific cell. But then I have to do that over and over again for each of those cells, right? So here's the next cell, and so on and so forth. Sum them all up, and this gives me my overall chi-square test statistic to test whether or not gun control and political affiliation are independent or associated with each other. Well, I have to figure out my degrees of freedom to go back into that chi-square table. Number of rows that I had, one, two, minus one, Okay, and then how many columns did I have? One, two, three, minus one, right? So when I take those, I multiply them together, I end up with two total degrees of freedom. So it's the exact same spot in our other chi-square table, right? We knew we're using the 0.05 p-value threshold, two degrees of freedom. So we have to beat 5.99 in order to deviate significantly from independence, right? Or from these two variables not being associated with each other. Right? And we find that what we calculated does exceed that critical value. So we have to reject the null hypothesis that they're independent and assume that it there is an association between your political party and your opinion on gun control. Now to figure out how they're different, I have to go back in and look at those individual cell chi-square values. And what I see is that it's really these two different classes of people who are in favor of gun control that are deviating the most from what is expected. And it's, I have to describe the nature of that. And it turns out that we actually have far fewer, this is a negative number, that observed minus expected is a negative number. So we have far fewer Republicans than would be expected that favor gun control, and far more Democrats than would be expected that favor gun control. So I've sort of identified these two largest chi-square values, and it's not always going to be two or even one. You just sort of look at this and you can see, well, these really are sort of well below the curve of these other two. Um, these are relatively similar, um, and so I'm going to describe both of them. Again, this gets back to statistics as an art and not necessarily uh, a science. So I might summarize that really it's that more Democrats than would be expected favor gun control and fewer Republicans than would be expected favor gun control. But what's interesting is that there really isn't much deviation in um, how many people are opposing it or how many are neutral. That actually matches what we would expect if there were no association. It's really just about those who are in favor of gun control. And again, we can go right into jump and do this in jump. We're still setting this up now where each possible category has its own row. But since we have two different variables, we have to make sure that each possible combination is included as its own row. So for example, we have Democrats that favor, Democrats that are neutral, and Democrats that oppose. We have Republicans that favor, Republicans that are neutral, and Republicans that oppose. So every possible cell in your table has to be represented as its own row in this data table. And then again, we're going to have that count column. And when we are doing this test for independence and we have more than one variable, we can't do that in the distribution uh, platform. We do have to go into the fit y by x. So we would enter both of our to class or category variables here, doesn't matter which is which. And again, we're going to enter our count data in the frequency, and that's how Jump knows to run the chi-square test.
notice that we have not done any testing for uh, normal distribution. And that's because the chi-square test is inherently a non-parametric test. It's just being run on counts. There are no assumptions for normality. The only assumption you have is that each of your observations when you're out there collecting this data, that they're independent and unbiased and representative of your population. So we're back up into the Analyze toolbar. We have to go into the Fit Y by X because we have two different variables that we're interested in. I'm going to enter my count variable into the frequency box and click OK. And remember, Jump is a very visual uh, software package. It's going to start by giving us a breakdown um, of how many observations fell into each of our categories. So what we are seeing here is basically in red how many people favor and so on the left side the Democrats, right side Republicans, the green would be the neutrals, and the blues would be the opposed. What we really want to do is get down into this contingency table and jump defaults by giving you the count, the, the actual observed count for each of these possible cells, Democrats that favor, Democrats that are neutral, so on and so forth. Um, but it also gives us the percentages, which honest to goodness, I don't find very helpful. So I want to mix up what this table is giving me for output come to my magic red triangle, turn off the things I don't want, I really don't want the percentages, and now I'm just left with the simple observed, but I do want the um, expected, you know, maybe I want to see, well, based on that test of independence, what did we expect to see there? I could ask to see the deviation, so this is now telling me how far off each of my expected values is from what was, was observed, and I can even ask for the cell chi-square. Now this is still a lot of data, so let's just clean it up and just take the expected out. Really what we need to interpret this is which of these cells has the highest chi-square, and then when I find the ones that do one or ones that do, um, in this case there are my, again, those in favor, and I can see the nature of that deviation, that there's more Democrats than would be expected that favor, and there's fewer Republicans than would be expected that favor. And I can come down here, see my chi-square test statistic for the whole test, and my actual p-value associated with that test. So here we can see just in about you know, 15 seconds, we were able to spit out what took quite a few tables and a bit of calculation to do by hand. And everything I need is right here. So that is our chi-square test for independence. So what all of that does is it allows us to test for significance and to describe the nature of the differences. But it doesn't give us that sort of secondary metric that we've talked about with our other tests, which is really how meaningful was this, right? What's the strength of the association between these two variables? So this is only something you would do if you do find a significant association, right? And this is the phi coefficient, which is a really simple mathematical equation which allows you to sort of quantify how strong that association is between those two variables. So you just take the chi-square test statistic that you calculated right across all your cells, this is the sum, divided by the total number of observations, and then take the square root. And the way that you can interpret this is that if you see something between you know, 0 0.3, so very low, it means you have a very weak association. It really, it may be significant, but that might just be because of your sample size. 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 is weak. Anything between 0 0.7 and 1 is a really strong association. So even though we had a significant result, it's particularly driven by uh, how Democrats and Republicans favor gun control. We can say this is really a relatively weak association. So even though there may be significant differences, there may be hope. This is not necessarily um, an association that breaks down cleanly across party lines. So we may not be that different after all. So I would want to include that in my summary and say that, you know, while it is significant, ooh, weak would be spelled wrong there, holy mackerel, a weak uh, phi coefficient tells us that really it's not that meaningful. Um, there are probably a lot of other factors at play in terms of whether or not you favor or, or oppose gun control. So hopefully this has been a useful whirlwind tour of the chi-square analysis um, and I'm hopeful that as you guys play with a little bit more data in either um, the group work or the problem set that it will become even more clear to you. So until next time,
happy statisting.